Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Psalm 45 today. Psalm 45 beginning in verse 1. You can study all of God's Word with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. There you will find four complete series, and this fifth one that we're on right now with the New Testament completed and the Old Testament right up until Psalm 45 today. So it's all there for you, archived at thebibleversebyverse.com where all you ever have to do is choose, click, and listen. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 45, my heart is overflowing with a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. A ready writer is one who has thought through his words before he writes them down. And that's a smart way to be, you know. To think through what you're going to say or what you are going to write down before you do it is very smart. And it's especially smart when the topic is God. When speaking of God, what we say should come from our hearts, but it should also be accurate, or it should not be spoken. Because we don't want to misrepresent God. And a lot of times God is misrepresented and there's no malice involved. He's just misrepresented out of ignorance. Like I I had one person say to me several years ago, God created man because he was just so lonely and he wanted somebody to fellowship with. Well-meaning, but borderline blasphemous. God was not lonely. God was not lacking anything. Do you think man was created because God was lacking something. God is perfectly satisfied in himself and with himself alone because he's perfect. It was the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit from ever, forever in the past. And they were perfectly content with perfection. So, again, just be careful. When you're talking about God, make sure that what you say can be backed by the Word of God. Two. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. The person who is addressed in this psalm is the King, the Messiah the Lord Jesus Christ, God's King. The writer says that the Lord is the fairest of the sons of men. And that's not talking about his physical appearance because the Bible teaches that there wasn't anything special about how Jesus looked. However, Jesus had the beauty of soul unlike anyone else who, who has ever lived, of course. Jesus had more grace, more holiness, more wisdom than the rest of humanity combined. Three, gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. Jesus is the most mighty, and he is the almighty one because he is God. Jesus created everything. Jesus died to redeem us from sin. Jesus promises to keep us and he promises to raise us from the dead. And only Almighty God can do these things. Four, and in thy majesty ride ride prosperously because of truth and meekness 
and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee awe-inspiring things. The right hand speaks of power, and the awesome things, Old King James' terrible things, refers to amazing things, like paying for our sins on the cross, the most amazing thing of all, saving an unrighteous sinner from eternal hell fire, the flames of hell that go on forever and ever, eternal torment. That's an amazing thing that Jesus accomplished for us when he paid for our sins on the cross. You can stop right there if God never did a single thing for us except that we would owe him our praise and our thanks forever and ever. But he goes on, he does more, turning the unrighteous sinner's life around is an amazing thing. Sending Satan and his devils and all impenitent sinners to hell forever. That's another amazing show of power. Only God himself can do things like this, and Jesus is God. Did I mention creation? How about that? We could just go on and on. Five, thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Jesus only uses sharp arrows on his enemies, which is why his enemies will fall on judgment day. God doesn't miss. The Bible says that the wicked shall not stand in the day of judgment. Six, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. It is a good thing that Jesus' reign as God will go on forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is forever and ever, and it's a right one. It's a good one. If God's reign did not go on forever, then when he got booted out of office or when he decided to resign, our blessings which come from him would be stopped as well. We are secure in Christ forever because he never stops being God. And of course, he never stops caring for us. Thank the Lord that he is eternal and he doesn't change and he's immovable, unmovable. Seven, thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Jesus hates wrong as strongly as he loves right. And Jesus always lived what he believed. And Jesus also proved, proved all this, his hatred of evil, his love for righteousness. He proved it with his strong teaching, which upset many people who simply did not hate wrong as much as he did or who didn't love right as much as he did. So they, he stepped on their toes when he taught them the word of God. Too bad. And the teaching of the Lord still upsets those who want, the cl who want to cloud the line that divides good and evil. That's why so many modern evangelical pastors cloud the line that separate good and evil in their sermons. It's so vague. They, they don't call sin, sin anymore. It's dysfunction. They're trying to cloud the line between good and evil because the majority of people, they don't hate evil as much as God does and they don't love holiness and good as much as God does. So they cater to them so that their numbers can grow, so that they get more people and they get more money. And who knows, someday they might even climb the denominational liar ladder and become a superintendent. Or something else. Wow. All on the backs of pathetic professing Christians who are hell bound and they're helping them to do that as they climb their ecclesiastical letter or ladder. It's true. And don't tell me that doesn't happen in evangelicalism. I know it does. I've seen it. I've seen it a lot. Not something that Jesus is pleased with, I'll guarantee you that. 
8. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces whereby they may they have been, excuse me, they have made thee glad. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. There's a lot of music in heaven, you know that? And there's going to be a lot of music throughout eternity on the new earth, too. Music of heaven and the music of eternity is going to make us feel good. We're going to enjoy that music, and it's going to be pleasant music, not chaotic music. It's going to be pleasant because there is a right and wrong. I'm not an expert in music. But chaos of any kind. Hey, do you enjoy listening to a, a two-year-old sitting down by a, by, a, by a piano and start hitting the keys? That's maddening. It's not the sound that blesses. It's orderliness in the sound. Godly music is not chaotic. It's not wild, frenzy, insanity. Like the music, so much of the music of the world. And the music in eternity is going to be music that we enjoy because we love Jesus and it's going to point to Jesus, it's going to exalt Jesus and we're going to feel closer to him when we listen to it. It's going to be pleasant. It's going to enhance an already perfect environment. It's going to be the kind of music that God likes so you know it's good and we'll like it too. Nine, kings, daughters, were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. The Bible refers to the church as the bride of Christ. And since Jesus is the king, then the queen spoken of here would represent the church, spiritually speaking. And that is Christians in eternity. Jesus will be the church's groom and we will be his bride. Just means he's going to take care of us. He will provide for us, make us happy. 10. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. In other words, renounce the world. God is talking to his queen, meaning the church. God is saying, renounce the world. Follow the Savior. Listen carefully to what the Savior says in his word. And don't concern yourself with the opinion of man. The one thing that the Lord hates is a divided heart and a lukewarm attitude toward God in professing Christians. And he's not going to tolerate that. 11. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is the Lord, and worship thou him. When we give wholehearted dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ, he sees that as a beautiful thing. He really does. That means a lot to him. And the Lord will see our beauty, and it pleases him. Wholehearted dedication to Christ is spiritual beauty, and it is pleasing to him. 12. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. Tyre refers to the Gentiles. This is a prophecy that Gentiles as well as Jews will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven through Jesus Christ. And of course, that's happening today. 13. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions, who follow her, shall be brought unto thee. This again is a reference to the church. Notice how this woman is decked out because we are going to look good in that day. That's what it's, what it's referring to. This is figurative language. We're going to look good in that day. And that's what this is talking about. We're going to look good to God in eternity <clears throat> because we're going to be the best that we can be physically, but most of all, spiritually. 15. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. 
gladness, and rejoicing will be ours in eternity because there will be no reason to feel anything but gladness and joy. Trouble and pain and fear and Satan and sickness, disease, worries are all going to be a distant memory to us someday. 16. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. This is simply saying that the line of God's people is never broken. Beginning with people back in Genesis and continuing through the apostles and on to today, it never stops. Until the end of time, God will always have a faithful remnant remnant of righteous people. 17. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. In this verse, God the Father is promising Jesus Christ, his Son, that his name will be celebrated in every generation, and it has been since Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And it will go on forever and ever. Every generation has their stars, their celebrities. But when that generation passes, so do those stars and their fame. I remember when Michael Jackson died. Michael will live forever. He will always be in our hearts. Yeah, I wonder how many of you people, I don't know, was it 20 years since he's died? I wonder how many of you people live every day thinking about Michael Jackson. Same with Elvis. Same with John Lennon. Same with whatever movie star has died. Their fame eventually passes away too. But you know, it's not that way with Jesus. For every single generation, for over 2,000 years, every generation, for lack of a better word, Jesus is a celebrity because he is God and he is alive. In every generation, he's alive. He's not dead. He rose from the dead. Yeah, well, with that, we'll stop because I went over my normal time, but that's okay. I wanted to finish this. Remember, you can study all of God's Word with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible verse by verse. If you'd like to be a part of Scripture Verse by Verse, you certainly can be by praying for me and God's Word. And when you take a break from studying with me at the thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, because that also makes you a part of this ministry. Until next time, so long, everyone.